you are on. Thank you very much. Uh, so my name is Melissa Dobbins. I am the co-founder and CEO of Career.Plays. And this is really a company of passion. Though I will admit, you know, you talk to a lot of entrepreneurs and, and people who start companies, and a lot of times it's very personal. And for us, it's, it's no exception. So my background has been in high tech and my specialty before starting this company was in product management. I ran product management and product strategy organizations for hyper growth companies. My specialty was to come in when they were on the 20 to 50 million mark, chasing the 100 million mark and the exit. So very high pressure, very exciting role to be the strategist in a hyper growth company. And yet, when I would be interviewed for positions, I would get asked the most ridiculous questions. Things like, can I fire people? Because that's emotionally difficult. And if my child has the sniffles, would I have to leave work and go get them because they needed someone who was going to be very present into the job? It got so bad that there were actually times where I'd interrupt the interview and tell them what they were asking me was illegal or inappropriate and had nothing to do with the types of positions, the challenges that they needed someone to rise to. They were being so distracted by what they saw with a young woman in these strategic roles that they forgot to test me on what actually mattered. And I finally had this, this feeling where it was either I had to put up with this or I had to fix it because Complaining doesn't do anything. And I've always lived my life of be part of the solution. And thus was born career.plays. So career.plays is a technology. It's a cloud-based candidate evaluation tool. We have built a tool for the HR department, for talent acquisition, to oh, qualify yeah. their candidates consistently and anonymously so that it's fair. Did I hear a question? Okay. So what do I mean by that? So what do I mean by that? You know, when we think about biases, when we think about the types of questions, the things that we ask people that we qualify our candidates using, so much of it is chasing the vision of the perfect candidate almost quite literally. So if you look at pictures like these and I ask you, can you pick out which one is the engineer or the teacher or the CEO? Mm -hmm. You're probably jumping to a conclusion. You're probably looking at one or two of these pictures and thinking, you know what, that one's the teacher or the plumber. Or you might be doing the opposite and picking the one that maybe doesn't look like what you would assume an accountant to look like, which is also biased. <laughs> So that when we're in these processes of interviewing, we're being swayed by all this information that doesn't matter. So what if, what if we made our decisions like this instead? And rather than looking at all of the information and having all of the information that can lead us astray, that we're forced to make our decisions without any of it. And there are technologies out there, there are technologies like resume redaction is a common one now. And that's great. It does take some information out. With a little bit of redaction, you can get rid of things like maybe gender, ethnicity, title inflation, education pedigree. But the problem is there's more lurking. There's information in these details that are left behind that can give away things like socioeconomic status, knowledge of keywords, if you're able to afford someone to write a great resume for you. So to really get out or to take out all the bias, you need to be a bit more aggressive with that black pen. That doesn't leave very much left to make decisions. So what we've done with career.place is we've turned hiring on its head. We start it all over again. And rather than starting with the resume, and starting where candidates are known, including all of that great biasing information. And they're really evaluated by telling stories. Maybe it's not their stories. And the process itself tends to be inconsistent. 
lots of individuals who are doing separate interviews, a lot of hearsay, I thought this, I thought that, all off of experiences that they might sh not share with the rest of the hiring team based on who was on a phone call or in an interview. So with career.place, rather than that resume, we start with the job and what the requirements are for the job, what will make for a successful individual. But other than that, the candidates are anonymous. They are judged by what they're capable of, what skills and knowledge and abilities they have that match with the position, how they will rise to challenges and nothing else. So that they're forced to be evaluated by showcasing what they're capable of. And the process itself is very, very consistent. Pretty much exactly what you expect when an engineer solves a problem. So we built a funnel, a qualification funnel, starting with the minimum requirements, the ante to play the game, the very basics in order to have the conversation. Do they have those basic elements to do the job? Then we switch over to soft skills. The reason is very simple. While candidates will tend to be fairly accurate, maybe a little bit uh, aggressive in their capabilities, they're generally going to know if they know how to program in Java or not. However, you will rarely find a candidate say, you know, I'm not at all a go-getter and I certainly have horrible communication skills and I am not at all reliable. We tend to be very bad at self-identifying soft skills, and yet we see them on resumes or on job profiles all the time. A go-getter, someone who's passionate and aggressive. Great, except we, do we meet those requirements? So we use soft skill, or soft skill assessments for that. And I'll show you that more in a minute. Then fit for tasks. What are those scenario questions, those job related questions that will get behind how a candidate thinks, how they are going to rise to the challenges and work within the teams in your environment? And then finally, a fit for culture. And I mean real culture here, not that ex culture excuse of I just don't like you or you don't fit in. It means the mission and the value and the experiences of the organization. And what you get on the other side of a structured funnel like that are qualified candidates. And because you're doing it anonymously, you can define in each part of the funnel what it is to be successful, what it is to pass. The other great thing about doing it in a funnel like this is that you're not wasting anyone's time. If they don't meet the minimums, why would you ask them to do questions, scenario questions? If they don't have the right soft skills, you certainly don't need to dive deep into the culture. So it is both respectful to the hiring team's time and also to the candidates. And then at the end of the process, that is when you can reveal those objectively qualified candidates. So why anonymous? In addition to that feel good, I'm making that decision for the right reason. It's actually far more compelling than that because it enforces compliance. Compliance is not chasing numbers. It's not trying to get certain percentages of certain demographics. It's fairly evaluating everybody based on their merit and not on things that don't matter. So by not knowing, you can't make decisions on things that don't matter. Of course, it reduces bias because it's taking out the bias triggers. And it's also on the flip side, promoting more objective decisions for who's best to be brought onto your teams. It allows for true apples to apples comparisons. If you ask different people different questions based on what you're seeing, making sure, let's say, uh, a woman is not gonna be worried about taking care of her children and how late a man can work, those are different questions, different answers, you can't compare them. So removing all of that. And of course, that wonderful mirror effect. With anonymity, you can't just keep hiring yourself over and over again. And we see that happening so many times with hiring teams. So far with this type of solution, we've gotten some really interesting results. So we're seeing up to an 80% reduction in resource time. That is the actual hour spent that the talent acquisition team is doing to, to sift through those candidates, present those finalists to their hiring managers, up to 80% less time. 90% reduction in ghosting, those applicants that are late stage that just don't show up. 
especially more entry level or um, jobs that are uh, seasonal, where they just don't have that same dedication. There's a big ghosting problem. We're seeing a huge reduction because the very act of going through our process shows commitment on both sides. And we've also gotten a lot of great data points around an increase in what they call diverse hires. Not everyone on the team is looking the same and an increase in compliance and being able to meet those audit needs. So, Lisette, that would you like to take a look? And if you say no, that will be very awkward for me. We'll have the shortest TRC session on record. <laughs> <laughs> but what I'd, I'd like to do is spend a little bit of time looking at the actual product, because it's one thing to talk about why we built career.place, what the structure is behind it, but how does it really work? That's the fun part, right? So I'm going to do something very... Oh, I'm sorry, I was going to say it might be appropriate, if you don't mind, just a quick stop at this point, just to ask the question. Or does anybody have any questions? Seems a logical place to, to maybe take a event check and then we'll get into the demo. Anyone have any questions out there? This is Jatin here. I have a quick question. Do we have any data that supports that bias exists? <laughs> there is tons of data that, that supports that bias exists. Um, some of the ones that are, are more well known around bias from the hiring process, which is where we're focusing, um, there's been Harvard Business Review and a few others have mimicked this around the resume test where they took the exact same resume, every piece of content exactly the same, and all they did was flip out the names. And they made um, one version had a distinctly white name, and then the exact same resume with another version had a distinctly black sounding name. And they sent them out to the same places. And what they found was the white sounding names had over three times the amount of responses than those with black sounding names everything else exactly equal. So that alone is a bit of an embarrassing example. Um, you have about two times the response rate if it's a white sounding name versus an, uh, versus an Asian sounding name. And there's variations on the theme of this uh, going into all sorts of different demographic variations that show the simple act of removing a name does make a difference because it triggers things. Any other questions? Yeah, this is, my name is Tim Corcoran, and um, I've got I've got a. Uh, <clears throat> I understand uh, on the the uh, interviewer side, but the interviewee side, I think we we assume, or maybe you're not, but I would like to to get some feedback here. We assume that they're capable, and they have a culture content that facilitates the uh, the solution you're bringing to the table right and and uh, one of the concerns i have is i as i look at this stuff is it's not the interviewer it's the interviewee that's got the issue right and if you look at all the, the the problems if we don't really look at how we identify and change culture at, at the interviewer perspective or the company perspective you know how do we deal with this whether whether you look at the the uh, the, the point you just brought up or, uh, you, you know, others, um, there's a lot of really competent people out there. Uh, but how do we get, how do we get the interviewer to understand what it is they really want? I, I, I've actually run into situations where they don't even, they, they don't even know. So how, how do you deal with that issue? I guess. Yeah, it's a really, really good question and a good point. And then to be honest, it's one of the biggest challenge points that we've had because when you take away that resume and that process that's been largely based on, I know it when I see it, independent of if they actually know what they're seeing, and you say, just tell me what you need. There's a lot of I mean, deer in headlight type of response. People don't know how to articulate what it is that they need in the basics for a job, but then what it is to be successful. So what we found is there's a bit of handholding that needs to happen. It doesn't mean we shouldn't be going in this direction. We've got to move away from what we know is a problem state, which is, I know it when I see it. 
So we have to move that discipline. But the fact is, is that discipline also needs to be put into place at the same time. So to have those cultivated conversations around, well, what is the proper interview for a hiring manager to help identify here is what I need, here's what I'm looking for. There are some shortcuts that you can take to start facilitating those types of conversations. Common ones include point to someone who's already really good at the team and describe them. Um, I, per I personally like doing interviews of people within the team saying, what do you do day by day? What are your top three priorities? Uh, most of the time that's very different than if you interview the hiring manager and ask them the same question, they'll come up with different responses than the actual boots on the ground people who are doing the job. So to just show that disconnect and start looking at pooling that together. Uh, so there are things that you can do to facilitate those conversations, but you're right, it's really important to start with a true look at yourself, uh, your team, your organization, and identify what those real needs are. So what you so what you're basically so what you're saying is that there actually has to be a a step one before step two, I guess is a good way of putting it, where you actually facilitate a conversation with with the employer that basically talks about who they are and what they want, and then make sure that the that the team understands who they are and what they want, uh, so they can interview properly, right? Exactly right. And then if you think about it from the standpoint of the product versus the conversation, we're tech. Tech is a third of people, tech, and process, right? People process technology. You have to have all three to be successful. There's no such thing as a technology easy button that's going to give you the answers. That's just going to pull you into a dangerous situation. And, you know, I, I have to unfortunately say this more often than I'd like, you can't go into a courtroom when someone is uh, accusing you of being biased and say, the tech made me do it. It wasn't me, the tech made me do it. Uh, it's always people process and tech. So we are a piece of the puzzle. And of, of course, I believe a very important piece, but it's gotta be all three. It has to be people on board. There has to be the process in place that's driving success, including your, the, your step zero of define what it is you're looking for before you can start looking for it. The reality is, is we're skipping that already. We're using the technology as a, a cure-all when it's not. Having a huge load of resumes piling in on you and then adding keyword searches in an ATS to try to filter through them so you don't have to look at as many, which causes a bunch of biases to begin with, is that really solving the problem or are we just trying to skip to step zero and go straight to I'll figure it out when I see it? Agree. I agree with that. But yeah, I'm, I would never advocate that the technology is going to be everything. It's always part of a three-part pillar. Agree. And, and, and the, other, the other thing that I, that I think is really, really important, you know, in, from all, too many years in business is, you know, you, you really, really got to look at the people. You know, it's, it's, it's uh, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, who the people are in, 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 in the value add. So if, uh, uh, people don't understand what, what it is they want to deliver or what the company wants to deliver, they're, ne they're never going to make it happen. So It happens with uh, everything you, from an RFP right. to... But if, but, if, but if you don't have people who know how to interview, you're going to lose, right? So you, 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 have to, you have to kind of go back to the company and say, do you have people who know how to interview, right? So do we need to train them as opposed to the people who are interviewing? I guess that's the point, right? I, I I can come in with anything, but if I if if I'm the interviewer, what what skills do I need to, to to kind of bridge that gap? And is that what you bring to the table, right? And and the other thing to think about is you don't have to make everything change all at once, right? You eat whatever the turn on a dime, eat the elephant in one bite, whatever um, metaphor you prefer, but that becomes daunting. And then what we see happening is companies putting it off because they see huge amounts of dollar signs against these massive changes and change is hard. So one of the big things that we advocate is it's okay to take one step at a time because every step in the right direction is momentum in the right direction. And that's great. Change is also more palatable when it happens in phases, when it happens a little bit more organically, controlled organically. Um, so even taking a solution like ours where you've got that structure and saying, all right, the first goal we're going to make is to remove some of these bias triggers. We might have the best questions, but it's better than throwing out resumes because I don't know how to pronounce that name. 
So we've made progress. Now let's Good. let's take that next step and cultivate a better library of questions. Now let's take that next step and talk about awareness for um, interviewing people who have disabilities and how to interact and, and what the do's and don'ts are there. And each of those steps are making the environment more inclusive. They're making it more diverse because you're able to engage with a more diverse community. So what I, we encourage is wherever that step one is, take it rather than waiting to have all the steps fully fleshed out. Otherwise, you're never going to move. Agree. I, <clears throat> I just want to see, um, so I, I like everything you do. I just want to see the company in, <clears throat> invest in, even if short term or small step, in, in creating that change because I look at all that as, as really, really positive. Uh, but if people understand that it's great to un to take in somebody who is uh, uh, you know kind of kind of uh, mentally challenged, or if we talk about uh, you know what, whatever you know whatever discrimination activities are, are are out there, eliminate those and understand what the content is, what deliverable is, and then make them have a clear conscience about what that means is really, really important. And changing that culture in today's business is a real challenge. So yes. hats off to you, hats <laughs> off to you. But you know, in, 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 and uh, I just think that uh, you, you gotta look at both sides of that equation in order to be successful. Does that make sense? Absolutely, you're absolutely right. Yeah, okay, thanks. So let's take a quick look. I'm gonna just show a few highlights because I wanna make sure we have enough time for more conversation, which is my favorite part but to give you a little bit of a sense of uh, how it works. And I'm gonna do something very non-traditional, but I do it all the time. And that is, I'm gonna show you something that's live rather than the demo. So this is my demo environment. I will flip back and forth to it in order to show certain details. But what I think is more compelling is something real. And let me go back here. I was actually just working on it. This is a real job, it's my job. So I've given myself permission to show this in, um, in this setting, please don't post everything you see and comments in terms of, wow, look at that person who, who applied, that's horrible, um, <laughs> just out of respect, because these are all real answers and real people. So we had an inside, or we have an inside sales rep that we have open right now. This is the actual activity that's going on. So these are the active applicants that are going through at each stage, so I know what my funnel looks like at a glance. You'll notice the color coding from, uh, from the presentation. We keep it all the way throughout. We also keep those letters in there. Um, incidentally, and it's an interesting question to ask any tech vendor that you're looking at, we do test in grayscale to make sure that if you are colorblind, you can still use the application without a problem. It's amazing how many people use colors only. But this is that basic criteria, the step one. Step two is the assessments. Step three is the scenarios, we call it homework. And step four is what is the interview stage. That's really meant for more of that culture feel. You do not need to use all of them. Employers use whatever variation makes sense per job. So you'll see different variations down to the job level based on what's appropriate. If you click into each of the jobs, the first thing you're presented is data. We're very, very data driven. We do not believe in the concept of post and pray. Get your job out there, hope for the best. It's all about being able to react and keep a healthy pipeline. So we have this live spark, for example, that's gonna show me at a glance exactly what's happening from a candidate flow perspective in this moment. So those are all real numbers of how our candidates have flowed through from the 184 that clicked the apply button all the way down to the three who've passed the interview stage and have all gone into, um, have all been revealed and we are now in talks with them. One of them has already been hired. We also have the different phases. This is homework, this is interview. So something very important because it goes against a lot of the, um, the hiring technology that's out there right now. We are not fully automated. We do not believe that the computer is gonna make a better decision than we are. We are partially automated. So the first two steps, which are self-identifying for the applicants is automated. You don't need to worry as an employer about any of the candidates who are self-identifying as not being a good fit for the job. 
or don't have the, um, the soft skills that are required. These later two stages, those are human. Who better to evaluate a response to a scenario question than the hiring team? So that's what these are here. And I actually have one waiting for me that I can dive into. So that's my applicant. I have no idea if this is a man or a woman. I have no idea how old they are. I have no idea where in the country they live because this is a telecommute position. All I know is that they have met the criteria that I've set. They have the soft skills that I require. And now I'm gonna look at the responses that they had to my question. Here's my question. This one's long, so I'm gonna go into another one because uh, it's a shorter question. So. This is a sales position. So I asked a very simple question. You're, a, you're on a call, a cold call. The prospect responds, that sounds great. I love it. I love everything about it. This isn't gonna work here. What are you gonna do? What I'm looking for in an answer as a hiring manager is somebody who's very respectful. You would be shocked or maybe not how many responses we get that are not at all respectful. They go straight into telling the prospect why they're wrong engaging i want them to understand it's all about what what is this person on the other end of the phone what do they value how do things work it's all about them it's not about what they're selling it's about solving somebody else's problem so we look for answers that are able to respectfully pivot and talk about the person on the other end of the phone and care about what what drives them most of our answers aren't good most of the answers are pushing what they have to sell, not understanding what the prospect needs. And we don't pass them. That little exchange, this little piece of information that takes me maybe a minute to read, gives me far more information than a bunch of bullet points on a resume that the person may not have even done. Switching over just so I can show you what it looks like to my, um, Oh, that didn't work there. To my uh, demo, just so I can show you, we added a couple things. Again, it's back to removing the bias. We put a lot of things in here to remove that bias. So if I open up my financial analyst position and show you what this looks like. Extra points if you can figure out what my hiring team is from. <laughs> but what you see is not just the question and the answer, in this case, the answer is an attachment. So I attached a data set. Here's the answer that they provided. This blue box is what we call our blues clues. This is that last second training that we're giving our internal team as hiring, as a hiring team. So the applicant won't see this, but I see it when I'm evaluating the candidate. That way I'm, I'm hyper-focused on what matters and I'm not getting distracted by what not, what's not even within the questions. It's also fully transparent, and this is hugely important from a bias perspective. I have my natural biases, even if I have no other information but the answer. So by having a team and the ability for a whole team to review and comment, now I've got a record of what multiple people think of looking at the same thing, and it will really reduce that bias while providing a lot of information, depositioning information. It's great for helping to make a decision, so it's a true team decision. And the same thing from an interview perspective. So once you get through, you review, you like them, you move them on, or you stop them. Interview as well. Oh, clicked on the wrong thing. Go through a review, and it's an embedded file. So you can see the response to their question right away. This stage, this is that fourth stage, is used about 50% of the time. We recommend that if it's a customer facing position or a position that has a lot of communication to do this format where you have that video or audio only interaction. Otherwise, skip it, you don't need it. If it's somebody who's gonna be at their desk not really interacting with too many people, why do you need to know how they're gonna hold up in a, in a conversation at this stage? But it works the exact same way. So you might notice it's all about taking the same elements, but putting a lot of structure around them. Does this all make sense? Any questions? 
makes a lot of sense. <laughs> so what I'd love to do one last piece because I am a data junkie. And so I love showing off the data. I put it to the second part just because I can go a little bit too long. But when we go into the data, it's not just about the overall, do I need to do something in these human aspects, but we don't let these go either. So even the automated aspects, you still need that human element, especially when you're working with multiple. So from the applies, this is back to my real job. So this is real data. I know exactly where these applies are coming from. So I can optimize my investment based on where the where my um, candidates are coming from. So it looks like ZipRecruiter here is doing pretty well. The orange is actually Google, um, which is the second, the second one. That's doing all right. So Google's adding a little bit, but it's really being held by ZipRecruiter. That's good information. And if you're paying for some sites and they're not giving you the results that you need, that's very telling. But more interesting is when we get to the criteria. So now we're into that, we're right here in that orange, that first part where you set those, here are the basics to play the game. And we don't, as I said, we don't do that post and pray concept. So not only do I know how many people are passing of the 184, 130 of them pass this uh, stage for us for this job, but I know why they're not passing. So I know this never happens, but if you have a hiring manager that's, let's say, looking for a purple squirrel, a unicorn, something that just doesn't exist, way too many skills, way too much that they want in a single individual, you're going to see exactly where they're falling out. And that way you can have this information and say, hey, you've got 80 percent. We've got an 80 percent reduction rate from the time they hit apply, not getting through the criteria out of, because of these three skills. Do you really need all three of them? because this is what it's doing to your candidate funnel. And now we can facilitate real conversation. Personally, my favorite in this particular data set, it's pretty good. You know, we, we set our, um, our basics very, very high level. We did not want to remove too many people too early. We don't, need, we don't have education. We don't have years of experience. We don't have specifics in technologies. I mean, cold calling for inside sales seems like a no brainer. Still three people said no. My favorite is this one though, telecommute. Three people dropped out because they said, no, they won't telecommute. The reason why I think that's so funny is we set this to a telecommute job. It means it's blasted out all across the United States and replicated all across the United States. And when we do that, we add the word telecommute to the title. So applicants see this literally as inside sales representative dash telecommute. But three people said no. <laughs> So how much are they reading when they hit the apply button? <laughs> but the concept here is it's not just the post and pray. The more data that we can do to help facilitate conversations and keeping a healthy pipeline, the better. And if something doesn't look right, we want to make sure that you can easily correct it. So if let's say you do have a skill that's causing a problem, you can change it right on the spot. Remove it, modify it. And then every applicant that has been disqualified for that purpose, for that reason, will automatically be notified and invited back in. So everyone is held to the same standards. So it's data like that that's very active and enabling. We try to wrap the whole process around that. So it's not just are you getting the right people, but is your process itself healthy? Any questions? So Melissa, you know me well enough. I have questions every time we talk, so I'll hold off for a little bit then. Anyone else have any questions? If not, let me ask a couple of them real quickly. So would you characterize your career place as a replacement for an ATS system or an augmentation to an ATS system? That is an excellent question, and the answer is yes and yes. Um, so. <laughs> We designed this originally, quite honestly, as an augmentation. So it's built off of APIs, as you'd expect with any modern tech. It's ready to be integrated uh, on both ends. We have some integrations to various ATSs on one end and, of course, job boards on the other. Um, so that way, data can flow very easily through our, um, our tech. 
what we found is that smaller companies, which tend to have a much more sense, a lot of sensitivity around how much time they can use for hiring. So you might have one HR generalist that is also their only TA person, benefits person, payroll person. Uh, they're they're underwater. So getting the time savings that we're providing with this, we've been we've been seeing a lot of interest there. Um, they don't want to have both an ATS and a uh, evaluation system. So we have we are checking enough boxes so that for smaller companies that are looking at their first ATS, they're not hiring tens of thousands of people. They're hiring five. They're hiring ten. This can work as an alternative. If you are in higher volumes, we do not recommend at all to use this as an alternative unless you have a really robust HRIS that kind of encroaches into the space, that this becomes an augmentation. Okay, that makes sense. And then I'm curious, a little bit along Tim's question around the, the interviewer and the got to know what, you, what it is you're looking for. Um, I won't name the product, but there are there's at least one software, maybe several others, that are really rewriting the job descriptions to specifically appeal to certainly segments of the candidate pool by changing words from like the word lead to manage or manage to, you know, you know, I'm not sure whatever words, but but the point is what's your opinion of something like that? That and in a sense it almost in my mind sets a set of biasness in the job description based on the fact you're targeting. And maybe maybe to help diversity and so on, people see that as a positive. I'm, I'm curious what your perspective, perspective um, is on that. I personally shy away from, I do not like anything that, that discriminates or attracts for the wrong reasons. So I know there's technologies out there that try to go for something like gender neutrality or feminine versus masculine. That's, that's one that's fairly popular. Um, first of all, those are based off of biases themselves. So the idea that women are turned off by more aggressive language, like the word aggressive or manage, is not universally true. And women like language like um, communication and collaboration, also not necessarily true. The, I do believe you need to be conscious about how, what language is used to describe things. You don't need to use the word ninja for engineers, for example. <laughs> it's, it's an interesting thing. I've seen it before. Don't really get it. Uh, so you can use language that for that is a little bit more universal. It's not triggering certain cultural things for some people, not others. Like football references is another great example. I'm guilty of it. Use them all the time. But not everyone is a football fan. So I can lose people if I'm using too many references. So there's that sensitivity and awareness to go all the way to I'm going to make this sound better for women between the ages of this and that, I think is adding to the problem, not subtracting from it. What I do recommend is to change the way the communication is fundamentally on the, the, the job description itself. So things that we do, for example, and they're all, all these little tricks that we're using to help um, with making for better behavior, is for example, put your benefits on the job description. People need them. And so many times they're not there. Or if you're a smaller company and you're trying to distinguish yourself against these enormous companies that you're competing against, which happens all the time in the tech world, you're not gonna have all the best bells and whistles. So talk about the cool, fun, quirky stuff that's gonna draw people in. That's great to do, it gives personality, but put the benefits on there. Put the things with the, uh, the summary, don't summarize what the job is real applicants know what a salesperson does they know what an engineer is you don't need to describe that you can describe what it is you're going to be doing for this company for this team get them excited about the mission and the work that, that they're going to be doing and then we also do pull the culture up front as soon as you're done with the job summary don't go into all the requirements do the culture statement you want them to be excited to engage with you that's the type of language and the change that I think is very valuable, not if you're going to use more communication and collaboration versus management and leadership. Good deal. So, that's, that's, and this is Tim, that's exactly what I'm talking about, being able to talk about who you are as a company and then make sure that the people that represent you through the interview process actually speak the same language. So yes. you facilitate that so that you know that the the 
in initial interviewer actually can actually talk the talk you're you're speaking, yeah, or is that something that you, that you look for the company to do? Does, does that make sense? Yeah, it does. And we're in the middle. So we've done a lot of that. We do, if, if you take a look at our website, www.career.place, and you go to our blog, you'll see almost entirely our, account, our content is around actionable insight tips, best practices. We're doing a lot to facilitate that conversation. Ultimately, we want to enable companies to do it themselves or to, to introduce them to the right consultants to work through that. We are a piece of the puzzle. The puzzle's a lot bigger. So you've got great hiring, you bring in a great diverse set of, um, of employees. If you don't have an inclusive culture, they're just gonna leave on the other end, for example. Correct. Or if you've got your best foot forward in interviews, but you can't do job um, evaluations, you're gonna lose, you're, you, there's, there's too many other pieces. So we wanna make sure that, the, that they have a healthy relationship with the type of, of consultants, with the type of materials that they need to be healthy across their process. We know very much we're the intake. Okay, cool. Because if they can't do it themselves, in the end, in, you know, if they can't do it themselves, they're gonna lose, right? They're, you're absolutely right. But we also want to balance that out with let's take steps. Like you can you can be better tomorrow than you are today. You can do it without spending money. And if you keep doing that, better tomorrow than you are today, better tomorrow, you'll get to the right place or at least get further down to the right place. What we want to make sure we don't do is make people think like they're going to need a huge overhaul with a very expensive consultant. It's going to take months and then they never pull the trigger. Mm -hmm. So I agree with all what you're saying. I do. I actually agree with all what you're saying. So, cool. Any other further questions? I've always got uh, one for you, Melissa. Nova, Nova, I Please. have one. Um, Please do. How yeah, you doing? I have a, hello. I have a, a <laughs> question, Melissa. And once a candidate has entered into, what I'm calling it, you know, your the third and fourth stage stages, mm -hmm. especially the interview stage, is there a concern that bias can now creep back into the process? Or are your first two steps um, enough so that it, it basically equal um, kind of equalizes the playing field when they get when they start um, stage three, so that the, you've kind of already eliminated the bias up front? That's a really good question. Um, I would love to say the bias is completely gone because of step one and step two. It is not. So that step three, this this scenario, that does go a long way. What we find is happening is people who get to the end and they're either revealed or they're in that video, the, the, the initial gut response is not taking over because you've already, okay, they've met my basics, they've met these pieces, I've already seen their work output or their answer. So this one is really, really important in that. So they don't jump to the conclusion that, oh, no, woman, you can't be an engineer. <laughs> uh, they don't jump to those types of conclusions because they what they're seeing first is this is the one who answered this way. This is the one who did that great code sample. This is the one who had that really compelling conversation pivot point for that um, for that prospect conversation for that prospect call. So it's around here that we get the most where people are saying, wow, I had I would never have let this person pass. Now, let me caveat that there are some biases that people do not like to admit to. And so it's hard to get that information. People are not going to say, well, I never thought I would hire a person of color, but then I saw their their um, homework. Like that's not something you'll, you almost never hear something like that. So the data that we've collected is around things like education level, numbers of years of experience in certain industries, we'll have that, where they came from in different industries. So we see it into, in a tangential way, but it's very easy to extrapolate that based on the the safer biases that people will talk about, that it's it's having a bigger effect. Does that answer your question? Does, yes, thank you. We had one on um, this one, I love the data, the the stories. I just I just love the stories. We had one the other day where someone got hired in a in a nonprofit position to run fundraising. So if any of you are involved in nonprofits or, or familiar with them, fundraising is the lifeblood, it's equivalent to sales. And they hired this individual and one of the executives had said that they would have never thought, they've never picked out this individual 
um, if they had just seen their resume or had met them uh, somewhere, but it was because of these great answers that she had provided that he agreed to interview her because she met his standards and they ended up hiring her. Um, and it was, it's a great story because that's one where while he, it was softly admitted, there were a lot of biases that were affecting the decisions they were making. And this hire showed that not only did it show that those biases were in place, but that they could get by them. Well, and actually, I have a, a follow-up then. Do you go back to the, the organizations that are using your product and, you know, maybe six months, 12 months after they've hired those people and, you know, collect their stories in terms of how successful those candidates are? Absolutely. We absolutely do that. We also collect sample. We also talk to the candidates. We talk to the ones um, who are like we, we run surveys. Uh, we want to understand the candidate experience. We want to understand how they felt during the process. Did they feel included or not? And so that we can constantly make adjustments. We are still somewhat of a young company. So the data, it's as I, I point out, it's data points and not data trends. But we're, we're moving more and more towards that. I did check out your website. I like your <laughs> site, so. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. So, Melissa, I want to, do you have further demo that you want to provide? I, I don't want to cut you short on that, but, but I think that, you know, certainly there are a couple of questions out there. I've got a couple, um, but I, I didn't want to shortcut your demo if you wanted to continue through that. We're, we have a lot more, or I have a lot more I can show, but it doesn't, I don't need to unless you're interested in seeing it because I'd much prefer to answer the questions and have the conversations. So if you're interested more about how, well, I'll show you very, very quickly. Everything is point and click. It'd be great if my mouse would let me point and click. Um, so <laughs> just in terms of, of writing the content. So this is how it looks. It's all just, it's exactly what you'd expect. You can add videos and this is the, the job description. So when you're creating your content, this looks a little wonky because it is a published rather than a um, a new job, but we even use when you're creating it, I think back to an earlier conversation, what little tricks can we use to help our employers think through what requirements are, for example. So it's kind of wizard like you can write whatever you want, so you can type whatever you want, but we use we put in a library of very common ones that are legal. You we looked at about a thousand job ads when we started building this and there was a lot there that was like yeah, i'm pretty sure that's not a legal requirement <laughs> but we did pull a bunch of them together you can write whatever you want but it gives you a sense but what's really important about something like this in this format is it lets you think through what criteria actually are from the basics of what you have to you know what you know um, education, and we act, we do little psychological tricks all over the place, uh, but we use things like certifications. So you see right here that it's not all about the degree. We're trying to push people outside of this college degree or nothing concept by pushing things like certifications. We do have a bunch of tips around not using this one at all unless you can uh, defend why you need it. Why do you need that education? That's a different conversation. But what this does is it allows people to think through all the facets of the skills that they need. And when it starts getting long, they're forced to see that, you know, it gets to too many skills and they have to start scrolling. That's uncomfortable for them. It's certainly going to be uncomfortable for their uh, client or their applicants trying to go through it all. Assessments is also an interesting concept. We did something totally different and not at all kosher from the standards for assessment um, providers and what they do. We started this company, I think I spent the first three months chasing down every IO psychologist who'd be willing to talk to me. <laughs> I had dozens of conversations with prominent IO psychologists in the, in the world of pre-employment assessments, um, amazing conversations, and testing out this theory that I had. So what we ended up building is the exact reverse of what you'll find in most assessment providers. You set what the assessments are. So I can, as an employer, say, here's what I care about. These are all, by the way, in ranked order based on the occupation. So these are most the ones at the top you most likely care about for this job going down, but you can change them. And I can set my pass rate. I want 50% of the general population reducing the noise. But that's it. 
So once I save this, I don't see any results. I only know if my applicants have passed to my standards for these traits at this level or not. And that's it. That's all I know because a 90% is not necessarily better than an 80% in the world of assessments with 20% error bars. So it's a complete reversal. All I know is yes or no. The candidates, on the other hand, get the results. So we facilitate for the candidates as much information as we can. So here they are applying for a job and they're being handed the results to their assessments, not with numbers, not if you passed or not, but if uh, where they are on various spectrums and what that means from a professional standpoint. So it's, it's value to them. And what we find is that once we get those candidates to take the first assessment, they take them all. They want that data. Very different. I don't know if you've experienced taking assessments for a job, but I've taken many, many assessments and I, as an employee, I wasn't allowed to look at the results. <laughs> and you did address one of my questions there by how did you stack yourself up against the other assessments? I think you just answered that very well. Uh, Melissa, I'm curious from the standpoint, you know, for, for, the, for those of us in the audience who are kind of the implementers of things like this, how, how, much time slash how much of involvement of career place staff is needed to bring this system up. It looks like a lot of point and click, almost self-serving perspective to take me through a process, but there's a lot of knowledge that you possess and others in your staff, I'm sure. How much of that needs to be brought to the table to really make this work? So most of the knowledge that we bring to the table has nothing to do with the tech. Once you get used to, we have we have customers who start and they they don't talk to us at all. They get there, they sign in, they they're like, okay, we post it. Oh, great! I mean, that's it, done. So we're not involved at all. If there's integrations, we get involved. Especially now, we're still we're still building out the integration library, and because we're a young company, we're doing a lot more investing there. So it's in our. It's actually great if you're if you're the first one to come in and want wants a new integration, we just build it for free. Um, so if, like a first one to come in for a particular ATS. But anyway, uh, so we do get involved in that end, but most of the involvement that we have is exactly to the earlier conversation. What should the questions be? Is this good data or not? You know, how do we present this to our managers to show that they are looking for something that doesn't actually exist? So it's that involvement in terms of what is the best practices for writing a job description, asking questions. It's not the tech, the tech is trivial. So I, I think on average, when I'm setting up a job, it will take me maybe 10 minutes to do the whole from start to finish, especially if the job description is largely written, though I do have a tendency to edit. But the individual, as you said, it's all point and click. The tech is the trivial part. And, and going back to Lynn's previous question about going back and interviewing the people on how successful they were after the fact, after being hired for a period of time, it, it strikes me that being in the cloud, <laughs> as I'm sure you are, um, thoughts about long-term perspective. You see, you're not at your data points now. You may be looking at trends. What are your general thoughts about what kind of trends would kind of come out of, out of your process, your technology? So I think there'll be a few. I want to show you something that I particularly enjoy. It's my favorite report in here, but the job has to be closed or gets to a certain point in order to see it. So I'm going to open up a different job and it will become obvious in a second why we have strict rules around it. So this is a closed job. We hired someone out of this particular position. It is a true job again. So you're about to see real data. And it's getting to the point of what we're planning to do. Now, we talked a little bit about going back to the different, um, to the employers, to the, to the applicants. We run surveys. And so what we think is as we get to more data trends, we're going to try to automate those surveys as much as possible in terms of understanding where the strengths are, where, the, where there might be rooms for improvement. And that way, we are in that continuous cycle of improvement a lot around um, the, ex the, the experience, the emotion around it, because customer experience is, a, or the applicant experience has a lot of emotional aspects, the success rate, the retention rate, things like that, the diversity element. But there are things we're already seeing right now and taking action on, even in data points, because they are very consistent data points. And this is one of them. 
So what you're looking at here is our demographic breakdown. This is a report that goes on every job. It does not generate until a certain level of data is accumulated because we will not give out or give away any demographic data on an individual. So you can't run this report when you have two people because you could guess <laughs> what the demographics of are an individual. So we do lock these reports down so that you can't get to that, that, uh, uh, that you can't pull apart that anonymity. But here's what we found, and we didn't like this at all. So this comes from um, going to the, the, the big sites, you know, the ZipRecruiter, Google, Indeed, uh, LinkedIn. So this is the type of data we're seeing across those big, more mainstream uh, job board type of sites. It's about two thirds plus white. So that's the first thing that we saw. So even if you have the most inclusive and fair process, if that's the top of the funnel, what do you think is going to be at the other end? So that was one piece that raised a flag for us pretty quickly. And right now we're investing heavily in um, partnerships with other job boards, with specialty job boards that will allow us to make this a little bit more colorful. Because the more we can, we can get people here and make that diverse, the better it's going to, um, the more chance you have of a, of a more diverse population at the other end of the funnel. We do not advocate what, what we were talking about earlier, where you're trying to tailor to one group versus another. But if you only have white men applying, you're only gonna hire white men. The ones that we were particularly upset about, gender looks good by the way for big mainstream. Gender and age also looks pretty good for big mainstream. Veteran and disabled uh, people with disabilities are about half what they should be. They're both sitting around 5%. They should both be closer to 10%. So our first, we're actually tackling these two first. We have our disability, our first disability job board going up next week. Uh, the second one will be shortly after. And then we're working on a relationship with a major veteran uh, job board organization. Because if we can diversify these, then we'll see more coming on this side. Yeah. The so publishing of these kind of doing. things would be outstandingly telling and, and probably uh, kind of raise, raise the, uh, the perspective of HR understanding where the problems exist. Exactly. That's, that's I mean, really cool. And even the way that we design this is based off of, of having that kind of influence. We talked to a very large tech company early on in our, com in our company's history when we were in the design phase. And we counseled them to do something like this because they had a problem. They had about 50% women interviewing for their engineering jobs and 90% men being hired. So where did all their women go? And they had spent so much time up front in these early stages. But when they mapped it out, they found that they'd lost them all in interview. It was the face-to-face. -face. So the men that were interviewing the women were not passing them. And what it turned out is they needed to train their interviewers because they were being triggered by things that they shouldn't have been triggered by. And they were, they were paying attention to the completely wrong area. Terrific. I recognize we're at one o'clock. I certainly would ask the, the Technology Review Council, I'll keep the meeting going on for a little bit, but if you have to go, certainly we understand. I wanna say thank you very much for you, uh, for your attending. Uh, Melissa, if you're willing to stay on board, we'll, we'll see if there are any other questions and I'll give you a little bit of feedback as well. Absolutely, if you need to leave, that's me. <laughs> <laughs> so any other questions for from the audience that may be left? <laughs> Put it that way. We'll go take a quick look yeah, at the panel. Tim. Tim, go ahead. Please. Again? Yeah. So all <clears throat> everything you're saying makes lots of sense, but here's my here's my deal, right? So um I really think I really think, which I think which I also think you're basically stating is that the uh, employer, not the employee, is the issue, and that their capability in content is limited, and their ability to address what is available to them, they lose in translation. There's a lot of really, really good people and opportunity out there, regardless of whatever, whatever you want to apply to the criteria men women you know where they come from how they came etc and so forth the issue is i have a certain set of skills that's available that i can deliver and then i have this group of people 
on the other side that works for a company that has some kind of criteria that they, they put on who they bring into the table, right? So I want to know how we, not you, but we can facilitate success in taking uh, corporate America to a different place. How's that? I, I actually think you, you've, you've got you've got a a point in, in time uh, that that brings us to that point, but we 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 need to push, or I think we're just going to run run up against, against another wall. Yeah, it's it's a really really good question, and it's one that we've been dealing with for quite a clearly for quite a bit of time as well. Um, one of the things that we started finding to be a great, for lack of a better term, um, greasing the wheels of the process, because it's back to what I was saying before, just get that first step, get that next step. We can't change all at once. Humans don't change all at once. Organizations that humans create don't change all at once. So we've got to create that, that momentum. Um, so that's why we do things like the, the tip of the week the tip of, a week, of the week for inclusive hiring practices, which you can find on, um, on my blog. But this concept of what is one little thing we can do that will not only make a difference and include a group that we might not have included before, but it's super doable. It's not gonna, it's not gonna cost you any time. It's not gonna cost you any money. It's just a very easy thing to do. It's this tiny little behavioral change and it raises a ton of awareness. So you're not into that realm of fighting, well, no, it really needs to be this way. I know you think we don't need someone with a college education, but we totally do. It's not that level, but it's, you know, if you don't, if you interview people and you move the chairs, their backs not to the door, then it will be far more comfortable for veterans, first responders, and, and the ex-intelligence community that have all been trained never to have their back to the door. <laughs> So it's so easy. You move the chair and you're suddenly creating a more inclusive experience for this group of people, veterans, for example. And a lot of people don't even think about it. You're, the response won't be, oh, no, 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 we need to have the, the chairs with the back to the door. The response will be, huh, I never even thought of that. I do that to people all the time. Yeah. And you'll get this tiny little behavior shift. And then you can do another one and another one. And pretty soon you've got this, this culture of let's all let's be better but i can be better i can make a difference and it's not hurting that's good <laughs> so then the appetite will increase so little things like that i think we we yeah. do we at, can all be part of the solution in any place in any organization in any role to make it better and to continue to progress and create that culture of inclusion and positive change agree, agree. But, but <clears throat> so the only point I'm making, so is, is if we all sit on this call and say, we align. So it's, re it's really funny what you did. So I'm a veteran. I've, I've done all this stuff. You know, I've seen the good, the bad, and the ugly associated with that. But I've also seen, you know, the stuff w with women and with blacks and with gays. And, you know, I mean, it's the, it's the flavor of the day. This country is just like, it's broken. When, when, you, when you look at this stuff, right? And, and, and when you look at and you make it as plain as you've discussed it and talk about that, there's so much smart and so much opportunity here to facilitate that is something, okay, it's, it's something I, I, I would love to align with, okay? So the point is, how do you do that, right? I mean, I understand your first steps, but how do you do that? How do you how do you break uh, a corporate America to in, include and be inclusive as opposed to be who they are today? Right. Well, there is a very simple answer to that. Unfortunately, it's not a simple process, but there is a simple answer, and it's the same. Corporate America is always going to be corporate America. So how we right. make a difference is with our time and our money. So you know, and I think this is happening from a more macro level. In terms of the big shifts, you see more Z's, millennials and Z's are going to make up more and more of the population. Z's do not have a tolerance for, certain, for um, let's say, ethnic um, discrimination 
it, there's just no tolerance to disease and as, as there was in previous generations. You're gonna see them refusing to work for homo homogenous environments. That's gonna hurt and corporate America is gonna change because they can't get the talent unless they look more diverse. They literally will not be able to hire people if everyone looks the same. Same thing from a money standpoint, you get a vote every day with what you purchase and what you don't purchase. And the more people who are conscious of these things and care are going to, to vote with their wallets. So between voting with where you're willing to work and who you're gonna spend your time with and whose products you're gonna purchase, that's what ultimately is gonna change. Now, that doesn't mean we don't need millions of voices out there raising the awareness and cultivating that change. My personal belief is we can do it in a very positive way. It doesn't need to be contentious. You know, we can celebrate the things we want rather than vilifying the things we don't want. And just by doing that, we're gonna shift the attention and people are gonna chase it, right? Because, oh, well, Google is now hiring people without degrees, I better do it too because Google's doing it and that's what we're gonna see. That's, I mean, that's the way corporate America always shifts. So this we're is just, an appropriate place, and I'll put in the recording, I forgot <laughs> to do that while we had an audience, Melissa, but Melissa and Career Place are certainly open to pilots. And so I, I'm gonna say it this way, if we can carry Career Place into the various places we are already in, either as consultants, employees, whatever it is, that's also another way to make the change. And I'm gonna be right behind that one all the way. So, um, any other questions or any feedback to give Melissa? Again, it's Tim again. So, you know, I've been doing a lot. I love what she has to say. You know, I, I really support where she's going. And uh, I think if we can change corporate America to move in a direction which is more positive toward people, is a is a great thing. So, hey, I'm on board. Right? <laughs> and Melissa, as as you are a, a data junkie as I am, I have to say that as you were showing us some of the data points and the things you're looking at in terms of the general sense of what's going on out there, I think you will be a very very in, instrumental force in terms of your trends and so on. Um, I'll put it this way. I will do everything I can to make sure that those trend reports start hitting the the populace out there through various uh, channels. But I think you're sitting on a gold mine of things that are that are both ensconced in your beliefs, your passion around it. The tool helps to both solidify the data and really has a really good perspective of the analytics that it's showing. And I think this is going to be an important perspective. What is, a, if you will, an ATS system or an augmentation, depending upon perspective, it's also a gold mine of some very interesting things. I would hope five years down the road we'd see that same chart with a very different set of graphics on it. Yeah, I, I completely agree. And we're very excited about moving those data points into data trends and then affecting them. Yeah, exactly. All righty. Anything else, folks? I, I know I've, we've taken ourselves way over. M Melissa, again, as always, I'm enjoying your conversations. You're an energetic and very passionate person, very articulate. A wonderful, great Disrupt HR speaker, by the way. <laughs> I, I, I want to also say, no, this, this has been a, an excellent um, session. So, again, thank yes. you. I agree. Very good. And, very and needless to say, I will bring Melissa to the table for an IRAM webinar in the good. very near future. <laughs> <laughs> yes, this is important. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Well, again, oh, thank, thank you, you for, the, for the four of us left on the call, left, or, or five of us, I think, that may still be there. Uh, again, thank you very much for your time and efforts. And uh, Melissa, thank you very much for all of your, your continued great work. So keep it up. Thank you. Have a wonderful day, everyone. All right. Thank everyone. you. Bye. Bye-bye. Bye. You too. Bye.